morning and welcome to the 32nd meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could I ask everybody in the public gallery to switch off their electronic devices so it doesn't interfere with the committee's work? Um, this will be my last meeting as Acting Convener um, and I know that members in particular look forward to welcoming back the Convener Jenny Mara in the new year. Um, so, can I move us to item one, decision on taking business in private and do we agree to take Item four in private. Yep, yep. Thank you very much. Um, item two is evidence on the 2016-17 audit of the Scottish Police Authority. And I welcome to the meeting this morning Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Stephen Boyle, Assistant Director, Carol Grant, Senior Audit Manager, and Mark Roberts, Senior Manager, all from Audit Scotland. Um, and could I invite an opening statement from Caroline Gardner? Thank you, Convener. I'm presenting this report on the 2016-17 audit of the Scottish Police Authority under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000. I'd like to draw the committee's attention to three issues arising from the audit and highlighted in my report. The first issue is the auditor's opinion on the SPA's annual report and accounts. This is the fourth Section 22 report on the SPA that I've prepared for Parliament, and it's the first time that the auditor has not expressed a modified opinion on the SPA's accounts. This reflects improvements in financial management and financial leadership within both the SPA and Police Scotland. The second issue relates to financial sustainability. The SPA overspent its budget by £16.9 million in 2016 17, which was accommodated by underspends elsewhere across the Scottish Government's budget. The, over, the, underspend, sorry, the overspend would have been larger if the SPA had not received £13.6 million as part of the negotiated settlement that terminated the I6 programme. I've been recommending for several years that the SPA and Police Scotland should prepare a long term financial strategy. It's encouraging that they've now done this, but this work confirms the scale of challenge that the two organisations face in achieving financial sustainability. The SPA does not anticipate achieving a balanced budget until 2020-21, and it expects to return to a deficit position after that. This financial context will make achieving the vision set out in Policing 2026 very challenging. The third issue relates to both governance and transparency and value for money. The report sets out instances of unacceptably poor governance and poor use of public money relating to the appointment of temporary staff, the approval of relocation expenses for a deputy chief constable, the decision to make the role of the chief executive of the Scottish Police Authority redundant during 2017-18. We will examine the detail of this decision during the next annual audit of the SPA. I welcome the progress the SPA and Police Scotland have made in improving financial management and understanding their financial sustainability. However, the scale of the challenge facing the two organisations remains daunting in terms of the scale of the change required, the changes in leadership which are continuing at the moment, the integration of the British Transport Police functions into Police Scotland and the severe financial constraints that I've mentioned. Alongside me are Stephen Boyle, who's the appointed auditor for the, the SPA, together with Carol Grant and Mark Roberts, and together we're happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. Um, I hear what you say about exploring um, the question of the Chief Executive's redundancy at a future audit, but given the significant public interest, I suspect we want to explore some of that with you just now. So could I perhaps kick off by asking you to clarify paragraph 22 of your report by explaining exactly how the SPA unnecessarily incurred an extra three-month salary cost in respect of Mr Foley? Certainly, Convener, um, and I'll ask Stephen to talk you through that in a moment. I just want to clarify my comment about the 2017-18 um, audit. Um, the decision was made um, during the course of 2017-18. The payments will not appear in the accounts until the end of that financial year, which finishes in March 2018. Um, we've included in our report because we recognise it's a matter of significant interest to the committee and we'll do our best, but there'll be some bits of that that aren't yet closed off. Stephen. Thank you, Auditor General. Uh, good morning, Convener. We set out at, um, at paragraph 22 of the report and elsewhere in the report the decision-making process that the SP went, went through in terms of the ultimate early retirement and the associated payments for the now former Chief Executive. Stepping back, if I may, um, a few months, really the, the decision point the SP took was in respect of um, Her Majesty's um, 
Inspector of Constabulary report into the forensic services within the SPA and the critical report that, and the recommendations that that, came, that included. At that stage, the SPA board decided to act upon that report and principally sought to amend the reporting line for the, chief, for the director of forensic services rather than to the chief executive, instead changed that to the board. As a consequence of that, um, the board took the view that the scale and size of the chief executive's role was reduced and in their mind that led to a redundancy uh, discussion. Um, the SPA board uh, considered um, an options paper at a closed meeting on the 7th of June and this was the point where they sought really to recognise the change in reporting lines and the change of the role. They also at that stage sought to engage in a consultation process uh, with Mr Foley. The, the judgment that we've made and, and the resulting uh, decisions around the convener, I suppose, are, are twofold. One is that in the exchange of correspondence um, that took place that led to the decision making, is that that wasn't held at a formal board meeting. And we felt that a decision of such magnitude would have been better served to have been held to, to reflect uh, good governance standards to take place in a formal board meeting. The second point in respect of we concluded paragraph 22 that has incurred an additional three months salary uh, unnecessar unnecessarily. Our judgment on that point is based on the fact that the, um, the SPA took a decision to pay Mr Foley's notice in full six months uh, of that. Um, what we've not seen is any evidence or any reflection of a, dis a discussion around whether or not they could have reasonably asked Mr Foley uh, to work his notice period. The SPA board were very clear that they felt it very important to retain the services of an accountable officer and to retain access to Mr Foley's knowledge of the organisation in respect of the accounting arrangements and that they felt that this um, led to ambiguity about his potential leave date from the organisation. In our judgment, and we, we reflected on the, the previous history of the organisation, that in every year of its operation um, and you know, some of its difficulties in, in concluding uh, year-end financial reporting matters are well known to the committee, but they've always met the year-end um, statutory deadline of, of laying its accounts before Parliament by the end of December. And in our view, that that decision-making process wasn't in evidence as to whether or not they could have um, sought to um, end Mr Foley's, uh, or conclude Mr Foley's uh, uh, employment with the organisation, but allow him to work his notice period. And we thought there was some merit to that, indeed, in that gaining access for his uh, interim successor to have uh, some form of handover arrangement. And that has led us to the, to the judgment that we set out in the report, Convener, that essentially, um, in Mr Foley leaving the organisation um, on the 30th of November 2017, that had he worked his notice period, that would have taken him up to February, um, at the point where the board uh, reached a conclusion to, for Mr Foley to leave the organisation in August. But instead, six months forward from uh, November takes us into May, and that's where we arrive at the difference of the, the unnecessary three-month additional salary costs. Okay, that's a very helpful explanation, but in doing so, it invites quite a number of other questions. Let, let me um, try and unpack some of this before moving on to some of my colleagues. Um, it, can I ask, because the, there are two separate issues here. One is the decision that's made in, reflect, in respect of Mr Foley's package, and the other are some of the questionable financial decisions made, I believe, by Mr Foley himself. Um, am I correct in saying that Mr Foley was the accountable officer? So some of the questionable financial decisions that you unpack in your report about you know, it paying for people's tax bills, um, etc., um, they would have been taken by him? They were, and the report is clear about both the personal decision-making and the fact that the accountable officer takes responsibility for those in any case. Okay, and none of them were reported to the board? Um, certainly the payment of relocation expenses wasn't, and we say that in the report. I think the others weren't, but I'll just ask Stephen and Carol to confirm that. Yeah, I don't see any evidence that the other uh, examples were reported to the board. <coughs> OK, so we can safely assume that Mr Foley took those decisions or was aware of them. Thank you, that's, that's helpful. Um, in the case of his own package, um, I'm, I'm interested in who actually took the decision then, because 
If it wasn't in front of the full board, Mr Foley himself was the accountable officer, so it would be inappropriate for him to take that decision. Um, who took the decisions behind closed doors? The decisions were taken by, by the SPA board. Um, wh what we are um, clear on, convener, is that that decision was taken by correspondence. Um, the decision-making um, around that point was initiated at a closed board meeting. So there was a board meeting held. But in our, what we've seen from um, the, the, uh, the papers for that meeting, that, that was more about the change in the role and the change in reporting lines um, as a result of um, the HMICS forensics report. Once the board uh, were clear that they wanted to proceed uh, with a change of uh, uh, accountable officer arrangements and chief executive role, that led to a series of uh, email exchanges with the chair and vice chair. And that was followed up once they'd settled on the fact that they were going to proceed with um, a change in role, that the decision making around the, um, the Mr Foley's um, financial arrangements to leave the organisation were also taken by correspondence. So this never went for a final decision before the full board. What you're telling me, if I've picked you up correctly, is this was a series of emails between the chair and the vice chair. Apologies, convener, just to clarify, not just the vice chair, from the chair and all the board members. So all okay. the board members were invited to express their views. Okay. Um, and, <coughs> and given, I think as we touched on, that this decision was taken um, over the summer months when you know, many of board members and others would have been hol on holiday, I think our judgment was that nonetheless a, a decision of this importance merited a, a full board meeting. I mean, in all your experience as an auditor, um, have you ever seen anything like this before, where decisions of this magnitude and sensitivity are done by email? Uh, no convener, I think we would have expected a full board meeting to, to consider such a, a, a decision. Um, can Did I you? Very of course. Convener. I think, as well as the, the question of there being a full board meeting, with which I fully agree with Stephen, the other point that he makes in his annual audit report and I make in the Section 22 report is part of the purpose of that meeting would have been to consider all of the options available to the board rather than simply the proposal which was finally agreed. And we haven't seen evidence that that occurred. Okay, that's interesting. Can I ask, given that, that it's clearly sensitive, in our next session, we're going to come on to consider severance and settlement agreements. Um, I'm curious to know that, that with something of this sensitivity, is it not normal practice that it would be reported to at least the sponsoring department? Um, so I'm curious to know, was the Scottish Government, did you find evidence of the Scottish Government being consulted um, or advised in any way of this whole um, process? Stephen. Yes, we did. Um, we have seen uh, email exchanges uh, from the vice chair uh, to the um, to the justice department advising them of of the progress i think what we're not clear is we've, that we've seen all of the email trail and i think that's something that, that we will we will follow up on but nonetheless we're we're we have seen evidence of the scottish government being consulted and made aware um, of the decisions that um, the spa board were taking okay um i'm curious to know whether that information is in the public domain and do you know the, uh, the when you say the Justice Department? It's a big department. Um, was you know who was the email to? Was it the Director General of the department? So I think in terms, of, I'm I'm not sure if that information um, is in, in the public domain. Um, and just if I can perhaps provide a bit more clarity, I think we'd, we'd say it's to uh, senior civil servants in the policing division. Okay, okay. Um, I don't know whether it's possible to have access to these emails. I think the committee would certainly be very interested in the source of the, the, the information you've received, um, because I think that's central to exploring what actually happened in terms of decision making. Um, can, I, can I move on and ask you, um, I suppose the committee, and you'll be aware of this, committee have, have had a number of Section 22 reports from different organisations, and when we come to question those responsible, um, they've either received settlement packages, they've taken early retirement, um, as is very much the case with the Scottish Police Authority. And the committee has concluded that we don't want to see public bodies um, reward staff for failure. Okay? 
given that that's the committee's view, and given that you yourselves identify the poor governance and the poor use of public funds, um, do you believe that Mr Foley should actually pay any of his settlement back? The first thing to say, convener, is that um, I entirely understand the committee's concern about this. Um, these are significant amounts of public money, and I say in my report that um, the governance failings are unacceptable. Um, to answer your specific question, it's hard for us to give you a clear answer about that, having not seen the, the options which the SPA board considered. Um, we know what they finally agreed. We don't know if they considered alternatives. Um, and without having um, that uh, information available to us, I don't feel able to express a view at this point. Um, it is something the committee may want to follow up with the SPA and with government. Let me put this a different way. Paragraph 22, as you've explained it, suggests to me that at least three months' salary um, could have been saved, never mind how the actual settlement was cal calculated. But that three months is an overpayment. I have no doubt that the, um, the, the Scottish Police Authority Board could have um, structured the agreement they came to with Mr Foley in a way which avoided payment in lieu of notice that wasn't worked. That's very clear. The questions about whether there were other options available to them that, that may have saved money for the public purse um, and fulfilled the governance concerns that I think you're alluding to is a, a different question as well. OK, thank you very much. Let me let other members in. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, General, let me, let me start on a positive note. Um, you've said there's been, or you stated in the report, that there's been significant improvements in some aspects of the SPA governance. Would, would you like to maybe highlight and expand on that? Yes. Um, my specific comments um, in opening this morning were about the improvements we've seen in financial management and financial leadership, which have been at the core of the concerns in the previous Section 22 reports over the last three years. Um, I'll ask Stephen and Carol if they can give you a flavour of the improvements they've seen, which meant they didn't need to modify the auditor's opinion on the accounts this year. Stephen. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, General. Last year's um, independent auditor's report um, on the annual report and accounts had a, an emphasis of matter which drew attention to weaknesses in, uh, in non-current assets, particularly the quality of records and associated explanations. We've seen a big improvement um, in, in that in, in during this year's audit. A consequence of that has been some investment in, in key skills um, in that area. Record keeping has improved, uh, and myself um, and Carol and our colleagues have received the, the explanations that we, that we requested for, for all of our inquiries. And we think that the, the quality of the finance team has also improved. We've seen that, the kind of engagement that we've, um, we've seen over the course of the year. And that led us to a point that, notwithstanding some of the issues that, that we do report um, in, uh, through the annual audit report, is that we were able to express unmodified opinions across all of the opinions that we were required to provide. OK, thank you. <coughs> I'd like to turn to some specific issues now around relocation expenses and so on, which have been um, highlighted in the report. Um, one uh, DCC received a payment of £18,000, which seems to have covered travel expenses and temporary accommodation. In your report, you say it came under relocation expenses, but uh, presumably that's a correct place to put it? Um, the the uh, total payment was the £18,000 uh, payment that was made in 2014-15 for uh, travel expenses from the base from which the officer was moving um, and rental expenses on a temporary basis. The um, additional payment um, in 2016-17 was for the sale and purchase of a permanent residence um, plus the tax liability on it. So they, they were all within the umbrella of relocation expenses under the uh, policy for senior officers. The £53,000 was a tax liability on the officer's relocation expense. Relocation expenses. On the relocation expenses. Yeah. So these were all... Ta the, I'm confused here because I've been through this in the private sector and tax never appeared, but uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Certainly. Um, the... Uh, 
Police, Scot Police Scotland regulations um, for senior officers um, entitle officers who relocate to take up a post to claim reasonable expenses for relocation. Um, that's not defined and it's not capped, which the SPA has since recognised as being a problem and has opened negotiations it's with the police. Normal, for it not to be capped? I, I think it's not normal. Um, in most organisations there is a cap and it's generally around the level of £8,000, so significantly lower than the figures we're seeing here. £8,000 is the, the, the level at which HMRC um, accepts that the benefit is non-taxable. Above that, it is taxable. Um, and again, the policies in place at the time um, provided that the SPA would cover the um, officer's tax liability on the relocation expenses that were incurred. Um, so generous. Is that a long-standing policy? Or? It is a long-standing policy, um, and I'll ask Stephen and Carol to talk you through the detail of that, if that would be appropriate. Mm. Uh, yeah, so the police regulations and the, in the case of this one that you're referring to, um, it was the Strathclyde policy that was used because uh, the SPA and Police Scotland didn't have a policy at that point, and it had been in place for a number of years. Why did they pick the Strathclyde one? Was it more generous than the others, or...? I honestly don't know the, the justification be behind the selection of the specific policy. It was deemed to be appropriate to be used at the time. Please. The, the, um, the Strathclyde policy in this specific example, I th we think, was lightly used because, uh, as Carol says, the SPA didn't have a policy, and at the point that the and the officer joined um, in late in, in 2012 was at the point that the SPA was forming and, and, and using its its policy arrangements. So we're seeing that the, the Strathclyde policy, as, as mentioned, um, didn't have a cap um, on it, but it did contain some other provisions about, about a timeline. I think that's one of the key points to be making in the report, that that policy, and indeed the, um, has a, a reference to an 18-month time limit. Um, and what, in our judgment, as we, we look to capture in the report, is that given that the, the timeline from the appointment through to payments being as made uh, as recently as 2017 um, exceeded that 18 month limit, we make the judgment that it would have been better to have had some, some governance around some of the decision making that accompanied this. I mean, I see the reason they've given here for, uh, for the claim exceeding the 18 months. Does that mean that the, the expense was incurred all that time ago? The officer was out of pocket during that period? The, it, the officer moved home um, at the start of 2017. Um, so the sale of the house went through in January um, and the purchase of the house shortly after. Um, so there wasn't a time limit in terms of the payment of the amounts. Looking at these payments, I mean, there was the 18,000, which is basically travel and uh, accommodation, temporary accommodation. The relocation expenses, 49,000. What did that comprise? That seems an awful lot of relocation expenses. So I can break it down a bit for you if that would be helpful. Um, so just under 15,000 of that related to the sale um, of the property um, down in England and about 34,000 related to the purchase. Um, the largest element of that was the land-based land transaction tax, which was about £30,000. And that was all paid for? Yes. Wow. Wouldn't mind a job in the police service then. <laughs> it's very generous. Um, you're, you've, you've stated here that relocation payments of this magnitude do not represent a good use of public money. Maybe you'd like to elaborate on that. I'm not sure there's much more to say, Mr Beatty. Um, as I say, in many public bodies, there is a provision for relocation expenses to recruit the best candidate for a job, and that's appropriate. Um, there is generally a cap on the amount that's available, um, and that usually matches HMRC's cap for taxable bene benefits um, coming into play. Um, £120,000 is a very significant amount of public money. And as Stephen has said, in terms of the timing, um, they, the transactions took place a long time after the officer had taken up post, um, although um, the uh, then chief executive felt it was within his authority to authorise them. Um, Stephen feels as the auditor, and I feel as the auditor general, um, that that was at least questionable and should have been put to the board for decision. It wasn't. So this, officer, this officer's payments, nothing went to the board on it, despite the size of the payouts? No, it was authorised by the then chief executive. Was that, would you consider that at that period it was handled 
in a regular manner? The, as I said, the policy didn't contain a cap and there wasn't a definition of reasonable expenses within it. So it's not possible on, on those grounds to say that the um, makeup of the payment was wrong. Um, but the policy that was being applied did include an 18 month time limit, which was um, exceeded by some margin. Um, and given that and the amount of money involved, it would seem to me to have been appropriate to have gone to the board for um, authorization for that. That didn't happen. Given that it didn't, and there seems to be a, a history of this, did the Chief Executive have the authority to approve it within his delegated powers? Um, he believed he did. Um, I think that the... Um the scale of the payment and the fact that the time scales applied were outside the um, limits of the policy, that is at best questionable. Um, and it's why I brought it to the attention of the committee in this report and why Stephen raised it in his annual audit report to the authority. Is it clear that, not, that none of this went to the board prior to the payments and so on being approved? Was there any subsequent reference to the board? Stephen, you'll want to talk through that. We've, um, there, has, there have been board discussions and uh, SPA audit committee discussions um, about the payments, but, the, but from what we've seen, those have been generated by our own um, annual audit reporting. Um, at, the, uh, at the SPA's audit committee, the discussion that they had on the matter, um, I think they, they have recognised that there is some scope to tighten up the arrangements uh, that they have in this regard, and we, and we welcome that process. But, but specifically, no, we've not seen any evidence that there's been a, a discussion yet, either the SPA board or probably um, more directly their people committee, which would feel like the, the best place. And I imagine that's where they intend to take um, their revised arrangements to in 2018. Now, the 2016-17 relocation payment was processed as a, a BAX payment rather than through the payroll system. And it was incorrectly coded as childcare vouchers. Now... Obviously, there was a tax implication there. Did the uh, was was all the tax paid then by the SPA? The tax was eventually paid, but as you say, it was miscoded originally and paid uh, through the back system rather than through payroll. Um, again, Stephen and Carol can talk you through the detail of what they found. That cost was met by the the, the SPA. Yes, Stephen and Carol. So when we drew their attention um, to the. the the relocation payments that we'd recognised, they then built it into the return that they were doing um, in relation to the, the tax and national insurance, and it was built into the calculations. So just to clarify, it was Audit Scotland that found the error? Um, it hadn't been included in the tax and national insurance calculations until we drew it to their attention. And how much... Uh, I don't know if it's included in the tax figure here or if it's an additional tax payment that's not... Evident. It is the figure of 53,000 that's included. It's included in, in that. It, it, that is the figure. Yeah. Was there any penalties and so on? Or? Um, there, no, there has been no penalties. There's no penalties. Um, I mean, obviously, obviously it's a concern that these errors take place. Uh, you say that the, Mr. Foley, the Chief Financial Officer, made insufficient efforts to ensure that. Uh, the remuneration report and the annual report and accounts were free from error and omission. Could you maybe expand a little bit on that? You'll, the, the committee will recall that there have been, uh, I think my predecessor drew attention to the fact that the compliance with the, the financial reporting manual had been uh, an issue for the SPA and, and that triggered some of the reporting that was brought to you previously about the need to improve financial leadership um, within the organisation. The, and I think, as we've, we've commented in the report, that we think that that has happened. One of the key um, points in, in the year is for the, the, an audit committee to receive the unaudited annual report and accounts before it's presented to the external auditors for us to commence our, our detailed testing on the accounts um, before the conclusion of the, the audit process. At that meeting, um, both the, uh, the accountable officer and chief financial officer expressed uh, to the to their own audit committee that they had gone through the annual report and accounts and were content that they were complete and, and represented a, a significant improvement uh, from from previous years that we subsequently discovered that um, they had been familiar with these transactions 
and that these transactions would very clearly have to feature in the, the remuneration reports uh, within the annual report and accounts led us to the judgment that um, insufficient efforts had been made to ensure that the annual report and accounts were free from any error or omission. Thank you. Morning, Helen. Thank you, Kirvina. Good morning. Um, I want to pick up on the same issue, although Colin Beattie's covered quite a lot of it, but I'm struggling to understand the, the point about the Strathclyde policies, because from your report, it looks like the Scottish Police Authority had no policy in place that, that covered um, or would have allowed these um, payments, these expenses to be met. So was it legitimate to refer back to the Strathclyde policies, given that the Strathclyde Authority no longer exists? I think this is primarily a matter of timing. Um, the, the Scottish Police Authority came into being on the 1st of April 2013. The Deputy Chief Constable concerned um, took up post at the end of 2012. So at that point there was no SPA to um, have policies um, and uh, the, the offer of appointment um, included a standard provision saying that reasonable expenses for relocation would be available. Um, Mark, do you want to talk through the, um, the way in which the uh, different regulations interact with each other? So, thank you. The overarching um, piece of legislation is the um, Police Service of Scotland Regulation 2013, which, which sets out the terms and conditions in a, in a general sense for um, senior police officers. Then beneath that, um, there are um, the, the kind of standard operating procedures. And in this case, that was the old Strathclyde Police Authority's operating procedures that took place. And so when the Deputy Chief Constable was appointed, those are the procedures that were in operation. Um, and it would, would have made sense for, um, for, for one of those um, standard operating procedures to, to be used as the SPA could not in any, any sensible way have existed and had its own procedures at that point. So what is the status of these Strathclyde policies now? I mean, can they be picked off the shelf and applied to other situations? <coughs> now, now that the SPA has been in, in, in existence for, for a number of years, um, it now has its own, own policies in place, both for, for, for senior officers, for um, officers and also for civilian staff as well, which are what it works to now. Um, and as the Auditor General says, um, the SPA is now um, looking at revising um, its own policies as regards senior officers' relocation expenses in, in the light of, of um, what we've reported in this audit. Okay. So I appreciate the, the timing issue in terms of DCC Fitzpatrick's appointment. Um, would the SPA have have been in breach of contract if they hadn't met these expenses? I think there are, there are two elements to that. One, the policy um, is clear that reasonable relocation expenses um, would be uh, reimbursed. Um, there wasn't either a cap on that or a defini definition of um, what reasonable would include. Um, now, that seems to me quite a loose policy, although it, it is um, commonly applied to senior officers in the police service. Um, and as Marcus said, the SPA have said they'll revisit that and look to renegotiate it with the police negotiating board. The second um, issue, though, is the time scale um, that the Strathclyde um, standard operating procedure that was used had this 18 month uh, time limit in it. That time limit was disregarded um, by the uh, then accountable officer on grounds that we don't think are um, strong enough to justify making a payment of this scale outside the time which the policy lays down. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the relocation expenses add up to 67,000, is that correct? Plus the tax liability of 53,000. Yes, uh -huh. yes, so is that considered to be reasonable? Um, as I said in response to an earlier question, I think from Colin Beattie, um, many public bodies have a, a policy which does allow the repayment of relocation <coughs> expenses. Most of them have a cap, generally about the level of £8,000. That is the same level at which HMRC starts to regard this as a taxable benefit. Um, so 120000 feels like um, a, a large sum of public money in that context. So given the cap that applies elsewhere, is this the first time you've seen a payment of this scale? Is it, you know, exceptional? 
It is exceptional. I think um, Stephen said earlier in response to an earlier question that um, he hasn't seen one of this size, with the caveat that the same policy applies to um, senior police officers, I think, across the UK, but certainly um, has done in Scotland elsewhere. Stephen, anything you want to add to that? I think, as the Auditor General suggests, that just from uh, the preparation and research, that there are examples in other parts of the UK where there have been significant uh, relocation payments made for uh, for senior officers, um, but not but outside of a police setting. No, I haven't seen anything of this scale. Okay, I mean, I think many people will be quite shocked that um, the former chief executive made this decision in isolation at the stroke of a pen, signed off these very large expenses. Um, Colin Beatty asked about the, the involvement of, of the board and looking back at this decision. Is the board concerned about the delegated powers um, that are afforded to the chief executive? Because, you know, what other powers does the chief executive have that we may perhaps don't know about? That's very much a question you'd, you'd need to ask of the board. Um, we know that they are committed to reviewing this particular policy. Um, the question about what view they've taken of the actions of the chief executive is one you'd need to explore with them. Um, and in some ways, I think it fits with the previous questions from the convener about the options they considered um, in agreeing his early retirement. OK, thank you. OK, um, before I bring in Liam Kerr, can I just ask, um, given that the accountable officer <coughs> You know, we've heard evidence today has clearly demonstrated poor financial judgment um, in signing off some of these packages. I'm conscious your report is for 2016-17. Did he exercise that poor financial judgment before that? This is the first time that um, the audit has identified um, issues of this scale. Um, we have, as you know, seen... Um, different examples of poor governance around the way that um, board meetings were being held and so on in previous reports, um, but payments of this type haven't come through in the audit work. I need to give you the caveat that um, an audit isn't designed to uncover every possible um, element of bad decision making that which may take place. It's a, a risk-based approach which uses um, professional concepts of materiality to give assurance in very in, in specific terms. So I can't give you an absolute um, uh, uh, confirmation that it hasn't happened, but it hasn't been identified through previous year's audit work. Given what we know about this year's or, or the audit work for 1617, and given you know the clear risk of previous behaviour, um, will you now go back and look? I would expect the SPA should be doing that um, on the basis of the audit report that they've received from Stephen and his team this year. Um, and I think as part of the 2017-18 audit, that will be um, part of what Stephen and the team are looking for. That's helpful to know because up to now, um, the SPA haven't really been proactive. They've only reacted to your reports coming forward to actually address any of this. So I would be very keen that they did look back, given his behaviour as the accountable officer in 1617. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to clear up at the start. Throughout this process, there's talk interchangeably of redundancy and early retirement. But those are two very different animals. Can someone explain to me why we use those terms interchangeably? They shouldn't be used interchangeably. They are, as you say, very different things. Um, our understanding at the broad level is that um, in the uh, former chief executive's case, there were two elements to the um, agreement uh, reached between him, him and the SPA. One was departure under the terms of the normal early retirement scheme um, in um, the, in the SPA, which entitled him to a, a sum of money which has been reported by the SPA but not yet audited by us, plus a cost for the strain on the pension fund, and separately to that, a payment for six months um, in lieu of notice, um, which, which was triggered when he left at the end of November this year. Um, with the caveat, we haven't audited those figures yet. Th those are the two elements that we understand um, made up the agreement. So which is it? What is the reason for the ending of his employment? Because redundancy is something that's done to him. Early retirement is something that's done by him. Stephen, do you want to pick up the detail of that? Um, I think reference back to, to the earlier um, answer about the, uh, the decision that the board took to change the status of Mr Foley's role. 
um, they came to a, a view that, in light of the forensic services no longer being part of his his remit, that represented a, a significant diminution in responsibilities, and that led to a, a change in circumstances. They're very clear that um, in the consultation that, that they went through uh, with Mr Foley and that his subsequent departure was in the context of an existing approved early retirement scheme. And that's what he his uh, part of his uh, financial departure costs are in respect of. And then added on top of that is the decision that they took for Mr Foley to leave the organisation at a given fixed date rather than working the, uh, his six-month notice period, which resulted in the six-month payment in lieu of notice. <clears throat> I'm not quite understanding, because if they start from a position that says this role is redundant, and on, on best case we'll give them that, that there is a diminution in responsibility, therefore there is a redundancy situation, therefore at some point his role will change, and that post is redundant, and there will be... Uh, payments associated with that. It sounds as though what's happened is that at some point a discussion has taken place that says if we change the reason for dismissal to an early retirement then we can manipulate the payments. Is that a fair statement? I'm not sure I would recognise all, um, all of that. I think what we would look to do is to, uh, to clarify whether by virtue of Mr Foley's membership of, which, of whichever pension uh, scheme, I assume it's the, the local government pension scheme by virtue of uh, him being a, a civilian member, and in addition to the, Mr Foley's age, that of the circumstances that led to his departure would have allowed him to gain access to um, his pension arrangements. In terms of the specifics as to the distinction between redundancy and, and the early retirement, I may need to come back to the committee in writing on that. Uh, I'd like you to do that, if you wouldn't mind, because it seems to me quite an important distinction. Um, has the SPA explained why it took... The, you, you talked earlier about the decision being taken by correspondence am, amongst the board. Has there been any explanation as to why it was done by correspondence, and would that be a usual process? The, the explanation provided to us was that um, the, they were keen to expedite the process, and that as the, the receipt of the HMICS report came in, in June and they had no board meetings planned for that period over the summer months, that they felt it appropriate to proceed and to provide organisational clarity. And on that basis came to a judgement, um, not one that, that, we, that we think is, um, is appropriate, that they uh, were able to take this decision by correspondence led by the chair and the vice chair amongst all of the board members. Have you seen any indication as to why they were keen to expedite the process? We've we've been, in terms of the uh, the discussions that we've had with uh, with the vice chair um, of of the SPA who led uh, the process on behalf of the board, is that they were keen that um, to provide organisational clarity. I think is the the phrase uh, that they've used, um, and. There are really two options that, that they chose to, uh, to do that. One was to use an accelerated process with the consent of Mr Foley, which allowed them to complete the process um, in their judgment by August, rather than engaging in a, a, a 12 to 14 and a half week consultation period as they set out as, um, as, as typical and as, as the right of any affected employee, which have, have gone for a much longer period. And that led them to the second element of what was the driver behind that um, was the, the clarity um, and, uh, and value for money. Yes, uh, the payment that's made, leaving aside the payment in lieu of notice, the ex gratia, if you like, is 43,470, a, a payment for early retirement, I think it's called in the report. Do you have any idea how that's broken down? What elements form that? Apologies, Mr. Kerr, we don't have that detail, and I expect that's uh, the work that we intend to focus in terms of the reporting in, in 17 18. I understand. Uh, do you, when, you, when you were doing your report, given that, if I may just do a, a very short summary, given that we apparently have an individual whose process is being expedited uh, to get him out of the organisation for whatever reason, uh, but this individual you have discovered appears to have breach the procurement rules for the financial position, 
has approved expenses out of policy and out of date, uh, appears to have paid personal tax but for whatever reason have failed to log it properly, is there any evidence that the board or indeed anyone else looked at this and said, why aren't we running a performance management process here? I, um, in coming towards the conclusion of the audit, I made um, inquiries of the vice chair whether there were any other avenues that the SPA board would be able to take in respect of, of these matters, drawing to her attention what we were planning to report to the SPA in the context of the annual audit report um, and those matters you, you refer to. Uh, and she was clear that they, they were, there were no other alternatives and no other avenues that they were able to pursue other than the one they did. There were no other avenues they were able to pursue. What do you mean by that? So there are always other avenues one can pursue. Quite. But they, in their judgment, there was, no, um, there was no evidence, there was no records that would support an alternative approach. Forgive me. There, I, I suggested there was an awful lot of evidence that suggested that another option might have been considered by the board. Is it that the board weren't aware of any of this uh, or took a decision that it wasn't actionable. I'm not sure I recited in all of the internal decision-making uh, within the board. I, I suppose I referenced the conversation that I had with the board and, and Drew, I uh, had with the, the vice chair, forgive me, in terms of what we were intending to report in, in our annual audit report and whether that um, would cause them to pause and uh, consider alternatives. Uh, and she was clear that they weren't. And, and one final question, just for the avoidance of doubt. When this process was going on, when the package was being built for early retirement, the Scottish Government were fully appraised of this and were aware of it and allowed it to go through without pulling it back. Is that correct? So, as I think I said in response to an earlier question, is that we um, were in receipt of some correspondence uh, between the SP and the Scottish Government that, from the SPA's perspective, alerts um, the Government to the progress that they are making with the process of, of Mr Foley's departure. It, which suggests that the Scottish Government were appraised of what was going on. Yes. Thank you. OK. Um, can I move to Willie Coffey? Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, good morning, Order General. I'd just <coughs> like to shift the focus slightly to one element of your report on ICT and uh, the policing 2026 strategy. Uh, you mentioned in paragraph 28, uh, and you quote the Scotland Creef report from just September this year, saying that, in their opinion, conditions don't yet exist within Police Scotland to provide a satisfactory level of comfort that sufficient technology delivery capability is in place to support the delivery of policing 2026. Could you give us a wee bit more background on this and where you see the, the ICT strategy in Police Scotland? Um, as the committee knows from its previous work, um, the uh, Policing 2026 vision is heavily reliant on ICT to transform the way policing is carried out, um, and we've therefore uh, tried to keep a close eye on progress. Mark, do you want to pick up where we are with that just now? So the, the current intention is we understand it is that um, the, a new ICT strategy will be brought to the SPA in March next year, um, and Police Scotland have um, brought in external support in order to, to, to um, complement the existing ICT function in, in developing that. Um, we see that as very much a, a critical step in, in terms of um, implementing and realising the vision in 2026. Um, but obviously that strategy is only the first step. Actually then implementing it and making it um, real and meaningful is the, the critical next step and that will require a significant amount of investment and a significant amount of um, additional resourcing in terms of the capacity of that function. But the, the next key milestone will be the presentation of that strategy in March next year. Um, I6 wasn't a particularly pleasant experience for, for anybody. Um, so how, how, what assurance do you have, if any? that we have the capability, the skills at the top of the organisation to a, deliver a, a sound new ICT strategy and actually deliver that in, in the future? 
so over the the last year there has last years there has been investment at a senior level in terms of bringing experience from from outside in terms of of major major change programs and i think the lessons have very much been learned in terms of rather than trying to do one major um, ict program that that encompasses 80 percent of policing activity it's much more of a modular activity and we've seen over the last year the rollout of an, a national custody system um, as, as a discrete part of that. Um, so I think there is progress in doing that. I think the um, evidence that we've got of, of bringing in external support um, to help with the development of, and implementation of the strategy is also encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, you haven't made any recommendations about it specifically in the, the report, but will you be coming back? Well, we'll see the strategy presumably next year, but will you be having a look at that? particularly because of the experience that we had with I6? One element of the annual audit process is, will be to look at, look at ICT. So um, in part of the, the report that Stephen will make to, to the SPA ne next year, um, there will be a component which will, will discuss the kind of progress in, in ICT. Okay, okay. leave that at that just now. Thanks. Can okay, you... can I just pursue the, the going back to the question of Mr. Foley for, for one minute before I bring in Alex Neal. Um, you talked about the options being considered on the 7th of June. Um, was there a paper? Was this considered verbally? Um, do you have access to that paper? Yes, Davina, this was a, um, a tabled presentation that was made to the SPA board on that day. Um, could one of the options, just listening to the evidence here that I'm assuming the board would have would have um, been aware of to some degree, was one of the options considered to actually dismiss John Foley on the grounds of incompetence? No, I don't think it was. Interesting. Alex Neal. Thank you, convener. Can I just clarify the timeline in all of this? <clears throat> Am I right in saying the first decision was a decision by the SPA board effectively to downgrade the job of chief executive because it no longer carried the additional responsibility for forensics? Is that right? That's correct. And then having taken that decision, they then entered discussion with John Foley about his departure. Yes. Before I go into the John Foley thing, because of a couple of questions on that, obviously Mr Foley has been replaced by Kenneth Hogg. I don't know what his job title is. Um, sorry. Uh, if, if I remember correctly, Mr Neal, I think it's Interim Chief Officer. Right. OK, now, what, what salary was Mr Foley on? I, I'll tell you exactly. It's reported in the an, annual report and accounts. Um, it's on a salary of between £115,000 and £120,000 per right. According to the press, Mr Hogg is in £120,000. Is that being paid for by the SPA or the Scottish Government? That would be made by the SPA. So where is the logic in having a chief executive whose position is downgraded, is on £120,000, is then going to be replaced presumably by somebody with far less responsibility and you would therefore think far less remuneration, to be replaced by someone else on £120,000? I think in terms of the, the specifics and the, and the payment arrangements, it's something we'll turn our attention to in the 2017-18 uh, year um, and, and come back to the, the reporting of it uh, at that stage. It was highly illogical to me. And it's another reason, Mr Neil, why we'd expect to see a series of options being considered by the SPA board. My, my second question is, just to get the timeline right on this decision about retirement, redundancy or whatever, presumably uh, the first option was retirement and presumably a date then was agreed with Mr Foley about his retirement. Mr Foley's leave date from, from the organisation um, was uh, ambiguous because the board were very keen to retain Mr Foley's services. Uh, through to the conclusion of the audit of the annual report and accounts. It was provisionally scheduled on the on the expectation that the audit and the annual report and accounts would be laid before Parliament by the end of October. Um, subsequently, th due to the, the complexity of some of the issues that before you today, that the audit was eventually completed um, at the end of um, the end of November. And I think as we say in the report that um, in our judgment, given that the annual report and accounts had always been laid before the statutory deadline of the end of December. 
we felt that the decision to pay Mr Foley's notice period in full um, wasn't um, a robust judgment to make. Yeah. So was it paid for both retirement and payment in lieu? Apologies, can you repeat the question? Was it paid both for his retirement lump sum and, and on top of that, payment in lieu? Payment in lieu of notice period was, was, was triggered in full and was agreed that that would uh, be enacted on the actual date that, that Mr Foley left the organisation. So that, sub, that, that payment will, uh, will happen at, with effect from the 30th um, of November and, as I understand, will be, will be paid uh, this month. When did he physically leave the organisation? He physically left on the 30th of November. So he's getting six months in lieu after his retirement? And, th and that's exactly the judgment that, that we make in the report, that um, and we have not seen any evidence that the decision around Mr Foley physically working his notice period, um, referencing back to the decision that was made in, formally made by the board um, in August, at that stage, the, if the timeline had started then, rather than it starting with effect from the end of November. Two other very quick questions. The first one is on all the decisions referred to that Mr Foley <coughs> appears to have taken in relation to the Deputy Chief Constable and other matters. Um, he has taken those under delegated powers, and that's a contentious issue. But did he consult the Chair or the Vice Chair or the Chair of Audit before making any of these decisions? We're, we're not clear that he's consulted uh, the chair um, of the audit committee um, or the, the vice chair. There is some, um, in, in respect of the relocation payments, um, Mr Foley has advised that he did consult the chair, um, both the, the now former chair and the, and the previous chair before that, given the length of time that took place. I think re regardless of that consultation, it was still our view that that would have been better served by taking place within either a formal committee environment or the full board itself. And can I ask you, because obviously the concentration has been on the chair and the chief executive, but this is quite a big board. I mean, I think I'm right in saying there were about a dozen or 14 members of the board uh, at the time all this was happening. Can I ask, has any non-executive director actually complained about the governance arrangements about having major decisions made by correspondence instead of at a board meeting? We've not seen any evidence of complaint to that effect. Doesn't surprise me. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, unfortunately. I think the non-executive directors and their role needs to be called into question as well. They've sat and allowed all this to happen and not done their job. And did the Scottish Government at any point raise concerns about the governance and the way in which these decisions were being reached? Uh, not to my knowledge, but that's maybe a, a question for the SPA and Government. OK, thank you. OK, I've got two supplementaries. First Liam Kerr, then Monica Lennon, and then Bill Bowman's been waiting patiently. Uh, just very briefly, how often is the chief executive position in a public company redundant? It, it is unusual for very obvious reasons um, that public bodies um, require a chief executive. That person is usually the accountable officer. Um, I recall many years ago when I was the controller of audit reporting on a case in local government where exactly that had happened and um, different but serious governance co concerns were raised. It can sometimes happen where the sc scope of the job um, changes significantly, um, but we would expect to see um, a full options appraisal with proper costings and then proper board approval of that before it happened. Which the avoidance of doubt hasn't happened here. In this case. Um, do you know, I, I just wasn't quite clear from the report, uh, and given something we'll be looking at later, was the early retirement enshrined in a settlement agreement? Um, no, we don't think it is. We think this, the, the Mr Foley's payments are in respect of um, an already approved voluntary redundancy oblique early retirement scheme, which is the early retirement component of it, and the payment in lieu of notice um, is with reference to one of the uh, standard operating procedures of the SPA, which gives the board the option to terminate um, an, an employee's employment with immediate effect, which is effectively what happens with you rather than working the notice period. I understand. Uh, so there's no settlement agreement, therefore no confidentiality clauses. Uh, one other question on the payment in lieu of notice, just for the avoidance of doubt. Are you aware if this was a taxable payment and tax was paid in full on it? So, um, we haven't audited this payment yet. 
um, and it's something we will return to in 2017-18. Grand, thank you. Okay, um, Bill Bowman. Monica, uh, Monica's indicated she doesn't want to ask the question, so Bill Bowman. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, just for clarity, in your work, can, can you confirm that you didn't find any fraud or illegal act? Correct, we've, we've, not, we've not discovered that. Well, given what Liam Carr was saying about um, breach um, procurement rules, out of policy payments, how, how close to being a fraud or an illegal act did you consider these? Um, we give full consideration uh, to that. Um, we took uh, advice of uh, senior colleagues. Our audit is subject to um, a, a peer review to, to test some of the key judgments, one of which uh, was those, and, if, and came to a judgment that the payments uh, were regular and they didn't represent fraud, particularly with reference to the, uh, the relocation payments. We're clear that those were consistent with the um, as, as Mark says, the Police Scotland uh, regulations, and also consistent uh, with the, the DCC's letter of appointment to the organisation. In your opinion, you give an opinion on regularity. These sort of sound irregular situations, given that you've raised these here and we've discussed them, and I think perhaps the term irregular might be a common use. Why is your opinion not qualified? As, as you say, we, um, that is a key part of our, um, our opinion on, on regularity um, of expenditure. Um, we were satisfied that the, um, particularly as, as a reference, the relocation payments were regular, that they were, are consistent with the, the laws and regulations governing that in respect of the Police Scotland uh, regulations. In respect of the, uh, the other elements that are, are captured, um, We've, I guess there's, there's two components. One is important that and we, there are key matters emerging from the audit, and we have reported them, both the Auditor General through the Section 22 report and my own um, annual audit report. Um, and the concept of materiality applies um, within this, this frame as well. So um, materiality um, for the audit, for, forgive me for one second, there's just a... Uh, is, is, I would say well, materiality, of course, is not just a number. Quite. It's whether it's a mission would be of interest, shall we say. So, I was, if I'm going to just maybe say a wee bit more about that, is the overall materiality for the audit is 14.1 million. Nonetheless, as you, as you quite rightly say, Mr Bowman, that um, within, for example, the remuneration report, some of that is a specific element of, the, the, of our work to capture the, the accuracy and completeness of that. And as we reference the the annual report and accounts that were presented to the SPA's audit committee, that they excluded these relocation payments from the remuneration report. Had they not been subsequently included, that most likely would have had an impact on our audit opinion. However, as we, as we see from the annual report and accounts, that, that these amounts were subsequently corrected and properly disclosed, allowed us to come to the judgment. And one that we tested to make sure that you know, we were satisfied in the completeness and and soundness of it that to come to that judgment. Let me just come to a, a couple of points then. In paragraph eight of your report, you, you talk about something not being value for money um, in use of public funds. In paragraph 12, you talk about not good use of public money. Do these mean the same thing? Um, essentially, yes, these are, are judgments um, on, on those points. So we're not satisfied that they are um, a good use of public funds, but not that they then um, ought to have led to a qualification of the audit. So it's just a slight variation in the wording. Yes, that's correct. How do you actually make that judgment? It's we, not a technical term, is it? There's no set down rule as to what is good or not good. That's correct. It's, a, it's a, a judgment from our collective experience and what we see across the, the public sector and, uh, and the importance of the good use of funds and, and of those examples. I think we referenced the fact that um, what was the norm for payment of to, uh, to directors uh, within the organisation and, and that those amounts are disclosed. And particularly if we, if we note some of the, the payments made to, uh, to an interim director of, of people and development, for four months' work we didn't consider £106,000 to represent a good use of public money. And equally, t in respect of the interim chief finance officer for Police Scotland, a payment of nearly two hundred thousand pounds for for ten months' work, 
in the context of the um, the other the, the uh, senior finance officers in the organisation being paid considerably less on, the, on an annual basis led us to the judgment that they didn't represent value for money. But you put yourself in the place of management at the time and what was facing them. So you would have done something different? I think we'd not necessarily, we think we recognise the importance of, uh, of financial leadership. I think particularly in one of the examples of the, um, the interim chief finance officer uh, for Police Scotland, when the organisation sought to procure those services and eventually ended up with a, a secondment from, from PwC, um, the terms of engagement suggested that the, the salary would be around an annual figure of £100,000. That it ended up considerably more than that led us to the view that it wasn't good value for money. Could I also perhaps just put that in context, that um, at the point these decisions were being made, the SBA had been in existence for more than three years, um, and they were still operating with interim senior officers in key financial positions. Um, so the, the context of having not made decisions uh, to appoint permanent staff over that period had both led to problems with financial management and financial leadership, and was still leading to the incurring of significant amounts of expenditure, which is why I took the view that I did in my Section 22 report. Thank you. In terms of um, drawing, making an opinion, given what we've heard about the board and your concerns about it, when you um, drop your opinion, decide whether you have a modified opinion or even any opinion, you <coughs> tend to rely on board representations, have trust and faith in the board. You don't seem to have that, yet you gave a clean opinion. That's correct. We, we consider that in, in setting our um, our audit plan at the start of the year, keeping that under review. And as we report in the, the annual audit report, we also draw attention to some of the weaknesses in the control environment within the organisation and in, in, in the annual audit report. And but not in the, I'm talking about the financial statements yes, that's correct. specifically. Yes, and Because reading those, everything's fine. And in terms of the, and, and how that led uh, to, to the opinion and the work that we need to derive to gain the assurance, it led to a considerable increase in the volume of, of, of substantive testing. And Carol may wish to, to say more about kind of how that manifested itself. Uh, one of the things I would say in terms of the, the financial statements, obviously the governance statement does pick up on the control weaknesses within the environment, and that's something that we built in. Um, significant um, audit testing was required to give the required assurance that the accounts were not materially misstated. So do you have faith in the board? Um, we are clear that in some of the judgments we've reported today that they would have been better served be being visible to the board uh, to test those judgments. And I think as we also report specifically on the, the example of Mr Foley's departure, that the decision they took to, to hold that, take that decision by correspondence wasn't a good decision. Just one final question. Uh, what board representations have you relied upon when we hear that perhaps they were not fully aware of all matters? One of the, the audit procedures that we undertake um, is, is to receive representations from, from the accountable officer, and notwithstanding the issues that we've discussed today, we also make representations of the audit committee um, as, as those charged with governance about the completeness of the financial statements and, and the accuracy thereof. And as Carol has mentioned, that as part that only takes us so far. The main thing that we ought to do is that we extended our testing uh, detailed extended sample testing to derive the assurances that we felt necessary to produce the opinion on the accounts. Sure, next time you'll take account of Mr Neil's comment on some of the board members. Thank you. Okay, before I bring in Colin Beatty, um, I want to pick up on something that Mr Boyle said. Um, you, you, if I've picked you up correctly, seem to suggest that some of Mr Foley's package has been paid, but some remains to be paid. Um, could I just seek to understand um, whether it, payment could be stopped if SPA chose to do so, or whether this is part of a contractual agreement? To take that in reverse, convener, we, we understand it is part of a contractual um, agreement. We, we don't know if, you know, as at today's date, whether the payment has actually been made. We know that Mr Foley left the organisation on the 30th of November and that the payment in lieu of notice was due to be paid in uh, December. I'm not sure if that physically has now uh, left the organisation. Thank you very much. Colin Beatty. Thank you, um, I just want to 
quickly touch on uh, something that's already been talked about, which is the appointment of temporary senior staff, which is a fairly substantial budget item. Looking at the governance over that, to what extent were the, the board involved in the appointment of uh, these people? Um, I, I see, for example, the interim director of people and development was charged at £1,000 a day, which is a lot of money. Presumably that would have been a board appointment. Um, I, I may not have all the detail in terms of, of the appointment, Mr Beattie, of the interim uh, director of people and development. Um, and I, I may need to, to follow through that with the committee. I think the main judgment that we are making in this regard is that is the value for money and the extent of the costs uh, for four months' work rather than the, the specifics of the decision-making process. I mean, obviously there's a concern about governance that keeps coming out and about decisions being made that perhaps have not been properly uh, uh, discussed and assessed by the board before that decision is taken. Um, and I'd be keen to know... Was it simply Mr Foley that made that decision? Was it a board decision? Specifically in terms of the interim people um, director, that was a Police Scotland appointment rather than, than the SPA. Um, so we understand that was that process was led through um, by the, the Deputy Chief Officer of Police Scotland um, through a recruitment agency um, to, to produce candidates and then the, uh, the resultant appointment. I only highlighted that one because it was £1,000 a day. The other ones are a little bit cheaper. Um, uh, not much. Well, yeah, £950 for Police Scotland Interim Financial Officer and £350 a day for uh, SPA Interim Chief Financial Officer. The other quick, quick thing I'd like to ask is, um, the, uh, there was an offer made for an Interim SPA Chief Financial Officer by John Foley, and then it was retracted. Do we know why? Was the board involved in this? Was it was there, was there transparency around how that came about? Um, we understand that Mr Foley led this um, appointment recruitment process, uh, working with the uh, the procurement department um, within Police Scotland. Um, we we highlight it because of the um, the non-compliance with policies and the the importance um, of such things that um, typically we would expect, and I think the SPA's own policy is that a number of employees would be charged with scoring any um, tender process. Or, but in this instance, um, what we've seen is that only Mr Foley scored um, the interim uh, Chief Financial Officer's appointment. The appointment process was flawed in the first place. So we're saying that the compliance with the policies that are it's not the policies themselves that are in any way in doubt, it's just the, the associated compliance with those policies. Do we know the reasons why the offer was retracted? I don't have possession of that. I would need to, uh, maybe a question for SPA to confirm. Mm. And do we know whether it was referred to the SPA board? Um, again, apologies, I would need to uh, go back and come back to the committee on that point. Okay, thank you. Okay, Willie Coffey had a small... Thanks very much, Commissioner. Just to... Uh, Maybe I've missed this during the discussion, but where was their own internal audit in this whole process? <coughs> was, was there in, did they have an internal audit team and did they give all of this a clean bill of health? Um, Scott McCree for the internal auditors uh, for the SPA um, and you know, their work covers a number Inter of internal, internal auditors, yeah. yes. Uh, and they, their work covers a number of areas um, across both the SPA and, and, and Police Scotland's business. Um, we rely on police on Scotland Creef's work. Um, we think it's of a of a high standard, and we've also noted that they too have produced some very critical reports um, of uh, SPA and Police Scotland's uh, arrangements. I think in reference to one of the other earlier, earlier questions, is that as a consequence of um, Scotland Creef's work, that led us to the judgment about some of our own approach, particularly the increase in substantive testing. So were they themselves critical of this whole approach, and were, were their comments, recommendations, or otherwise? ignored by the board? Um, the internal auditors produce a, an annual report um, on, on the organisation and that too highlighted some significant weaknesses. That, okay. That weren't actioned or taken up, I accepted think by the board? The arrangements that the SPA Police Scotland have for, uh, for monitoring and following up um, audit actions um, has improved. Is improving. There's a detailed discussion and, and log of any uh, matters that are brought to the attention through audit reports, and these are subject to detailed discussion 
um, at audit committees. I think, as the Auditor General suggested in response to a previous matter, uh, auditors will report what they find based on the, the scope of the work and, and the planned programme of, of activities. And certainly we are clear that Scotland Creef's reports uh, are full and complete and, and we continue to place reliance upon them. OK, thank you. OK. Um, can I, in wrapping this up, just ask for one further point of clarification? Um, in the SPA announcement on the 21st of August, um, 24th of August, sorry, that Mr Foley had opted to take early retirement, they issued a statement. The statement said, although the CEO role becomes redundant from 1st September 2017, the board has given consideration to the most appropriate point for the accountable officer responsibilities to transition, including seeking the view of Audit Scotland. What did they ask you? What did you say? And did they listen to you? Um, we'll take that between us, uh, convener, and I'll kick off. Um, I took a phone call from the Vice Chair of the Authority of the Board on the 24th of July, um, in which she told me that they were seeking to, um, that they were reviewing the scope of the Chief Executive's post um, on the basis of HMIC's recommendation about forensic services. Um, I thanked her for letting me know. I said that, of course, we would need to audit that and asked her to liaise with Stephen Boyle as the appointed auditor um, of the SPA. Um, and Stephen, you want to pick up? I, I met with the vice chair um, in August and she talked us through the, the timeline and process that they had gone through uh, to date. Uh, we asked that she provided us with some of the evidence to, to support the decision-making process and she provided us with some emails and, and more of the timeline, and that was provided to us in mid-September. You questioned the information that you were provided with? So we went through the evidence and, and used that in the compilation um, of our report, and then I had a further phone call with the, uh, the Vice Chair in mid-October, convener. So as well as being the recipient of the information, um, what did you say back to the Vice Chair of the SPA? I think at that particularly reference to the October meeting that uh, in light of what we'd seen and particularly brought in the other matters that, that are before you today was get reference back to the, the earlier discussion today was whether that prompted them to pause and reflect on any of that before making their final decision uh, and the vice chair was clear that, that it didn't. Okay so you made recommendations to them um, and they didn't stop and think about what was happening. Is that a fair comment? Yes. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Can I say, um, you know, I've, I've you know, been around politics a long time, but this is probably the most shocking example I've seen of financial mismanagement and, and poor judgment, indeed poor judgment, um, about accountability and, and poor financial judgment um, made by the accountable officer in this case, Mr Foley. Um, we've heard eye-watering sums of money, um, you know, quite extraordinary expenditure signed off by him without reference to the board. So I am looking forward very much to your 1718 report. I hope it will be robust and I hope it will also take the opportunity to look back at whether this practice happened before 1617, um, because I'm sure it didn't just arise in this financial year alone. When you consider that the, the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland are facing huge deficits in terms of the long-term financial project projections, 47 million this year coming, 35 million the year after, continuing deficits. I find this, frankly, quite shocking and incredible. The committee will, of course, reflect on the evidence we've heard today. Can I thank the witnesses very much um, for their evidence today? And we'll now take a short break um, and as we introduce our next witnesses. Thank you. Thank you.
Can I move us to item three on the agenda, which is settlement agreements, and we'll take evidence from the Scottish Government on the related topics of settlement agreements and severance policy. Can I welcome to the committee this morning Paul Gray, Director General Health and Social Care from the Scottish Government, and also, of course, Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, and Paul Johnson, who's Director General of Education, Communities and Justice for the Scottish Gov Government. Um, I understand neither of you wishes to make an opening statement, um, so I will maybe help Hopefully, set some context, so bear with me. Um, the Scottish Government prepares an annual report on settlement agreements, which are legally binding contracts between employers and employees to resolve employment disputes. Separately, we recently wrote to the Scottish Government to highlight some instances where people who may have been at least partly responsible for a performance issue at a public body were no longer in post by the time we came to consider the Auditor General's report. Um, the committee noted our frustration about how such individuals could be held to account and said the award of agreements should be very carefully considered. In short, our concern was that failure should not be rewarded. In his response, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution noted our frustration and said, I fully agree with the committee's view that failure in public bodies should not be rewarded. The Cabinet Secretary also said the Scottish Government's recent consultation on a severance policy for Scotland did not set out to respond to our concerns. He did say, however, that our raising issues about exit payments provides increased focus on the opportunities to claw back exit payments, especially where failures are apparent. We will hear from officials about the progress the Scottish Government is making with its policy, how the Parliament and its committees will be kept informed, and how taxpayers can be reassured that money is being well spent. Before I move to um, a very gentle opening question, um, I think both the witnesses will be aware that the committee has taken evidence this morning on the Auditor General's report into the Scottish Police Authority. Um, I would not be surprised if members wanted to explore some of those issues with you in relation to payments made to um, public sector employees. Um, first, though, let me ask a question on settlement agreements that we've previously asked um, but wasn't, wasn't answered fully. Now, the Scottish Government said it would adopt across wider public bodies the NHS Scotland approach to the use of confidentiality clauses, i.e. a presumption against their use unless there were clear and transparent reasons for their inclusion. Despite this, the use of confidentiality clauses by the Scottish Government and public bodies increased from 21 to 36, between 2014-15 and 2015-16. Um, the question is, therefore, um, can the Scottish Government influence the number of confidentiality clauses used in a particular year or not? Mr Johnson. Convener, may I start by acknowledging that I have heard the earlier discussion and, of course, anticipate the committee's interests in the issues around the Scottish Police Authority, in particular, what role the government um, exercised in that matter, um, and will seek to ensure that uh, the committee is furnished with uh, all relevant correspondence uh, between the government and the SPA, and I appreciate you may wish to come on to that in more detail later on in the session. In relation to your specific point about the number of confidentiality clauses um, that have been um, inserted, the, the number numbers are all set out in the report that you have in front of you. Um, and the position that we have is that confidentiality clauses will not be inserted automatically. Indeed, there is a presumption against their use. However, um, there are uh, situations where either the employee or the employer wishes uh, and has reason for um, including a confidentiality clause. The role of government will be to consider and advise on, uh, on the use of those clauses. One point that I know has concerned the committee that we can be very clear about is whether in any cases the use of a confidentiality clause might get in the way of an individual making a protected disclosure under whistleblowing legislation. Uh, we can be very clear that there are no circumstances in which an individual could be, pre could be prevented from making such a disclosure. Liam Kerr wants to come in with a supplementary, then Alex Neil. Yeah, just on the confidentiality clauses, um, I don't understand why there is a presumption against using them. And I also don't understand, in the letter that we've had, about where, where you talk about confidentiality clauses, you quite clearly say that 
they, they are used at the request of the employee or their legal representative. Now, I don't understand that, because as an employer, I would want the confidentiality. It's more important to me as employer to secure confidentiality than the employee or their legal representative. So why this presumption? Well, my understanding is the presumption, in, if we look back, at one point, confidentiality clauses were, were inserted as a matter of routine. And um, previous committees have expressed concern about that routine practice around the use of confidentiality clauses. Having uh, reflected on those concerns, the decision was made that they should not be inserted as a matter of routine, and rather uh, the presumption would be that there would not be a clause. It would then be for consideration to be given on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether there was a desire uh, for, the clause, for the clauses to be inserted. I would say my understanding is that the employer can also request uh, a confidentiality clause as well as the uh, employee. But that's slightly different from the letter, but... Uh we are the employer in this situation. The, the, the public is the employer. And I, I would have said the confidentiality clause is about protecting the employer. It's about securing, uh, or the agreement is about protecting the employer, making a payment to, 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 if you like, buy the rights of the employee. And we have a, a list in the appendix of uh, payments that have been made. And what I can see is that the two of the top three agreements in terms of cash sum that have been concluded, two of them do not have a confidentiality clause in. Uh, one of those payments is over £200,000. I find that extraordinary. But is that just the way it is? Well, I think that reflects the fact that there is consideration given on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether or not a confidentiality clause is needed and is requested by either of the parties. Okay. okay. Alex Neil. Thank you, Convener. My first question is to Paul Johnson. Uh, Paul, at the moment there are a number of people suspended by Police Scotland. The Chief Constable has been in special leave since September, I believe, and I think it's four other fairly senior officers who are suspended, one of whom has indicated he is taking his retirement in the meantime. What's the status, what's the current status? I realise you can't comment on the detail but what's the current status in terms of when these investigations, have they been completed, when are they due to be completed, and uh, when will this be brought to a conclusion? Well, in a number of the cases uh, to which you refer, the investigations are being conducted by the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner, who is um, acting as a as an independent person, and I do not have information today for the committee um, about the time period for the investigations that she is conducting. I can certainly seek to obtain further information about that and provide that to the committee, but I don't have it today. Can I ask about the investigations into the allegations against the Chief Constable? Uh, has PERT concluded their investigations into the allegations against the Chief Constable? No, my understanding is that those investigations are still ongoing. Okay, um, and uh, do you any idea when they're likely to be concluded? As I say, as of today, I do not have um, a, a information about the time the time scale that I can provide to the committee. Right, and there's no indication from the SPA are they, are they involved in the investigation. I know that the SPA uh, is certainly engaging with the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner on the issue, having first passed the matters to the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner. Um, but as I say, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have details as to the time, the time frame for the investigation completing. So is it not true that the former chair of the SPA, Andrew Flanagan, wanted uh, the Chief Constable reinstated? Well, there have the, 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 the understanding that I have is that the uh, Scottish Police Authority gives consideration to whether or not um, the period of leave will be brought to an end, uh, and it does so on a regular basis. And um, the last time that has been considered, again, my understanding is that the board agreed that um, the uh, period of leave would be continued. And there's been no representation from Andrew Flanagan 
to have the chief constable reinstated? There, there have been uh, discussions, I know, um, around the around whether or not the Chief Constable should uh, return. Uh, my understanding is that at present, as I say, he is, he is not suspended. Uh, he is on a period of leave, so absolutely these matters have been uh, discussed and considered carefully, um, but the most recent position uh, is that the Chief Constable's leave uh, continues for the time being. Just to be clear, in any of these discussions, did Andrew Flanagan ask that the Chief Constable would be reinstated? I think that, that there have been points at which the view of the former chair was that it uh, was that uh, the chief constable was that it may be suitable for the chief constable to uh, return. And how long ago was that? Um, I don't have the specific dates, although again, I could um, October, November. Certainly, in in in, re in recent weeks. So. What's the procedure? Does, does, does the chair make that request to the cabinet secretary or to the government or to yourself as the accountable officer? Uh, what, what happened? Did Andrew Flanagan come to you and say he wanted the chief constable reinstated? What was the procedure? It is a decision for the board as to whether or not the uh, chief constable, uh, whether or not the chief constable's leave should be continued. Um, and indeed, the, the chief constable clearly has a role as well in terms of his, uh, in terms of the, the, the arrangements. Um, I, there have been discussions with government uh, on these issues. Uh, the position of government is that um, in all of these considerations, um, it's important that the board considers the, 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 the full range of circumstances, um, and that includes uh, the need for the board to engage with the Police Investigations Review Commissioner on uh, whether or not reinstatement should take place. So can I just clarify, because there's a very strong rumour going around and, you know, I don't believe rumours until I hear the, hear the facts. There's a very strong rumour going around that Mr Flanagan wanted to reinstate the Chief Constable because the investigations found that the Chief Constable had uh, done nothing wrong. Is that true? Well, I would be very loath to comment on any rumours. Um, all I would say is that the investigation, to the best of my knowledge, has not yet been concluded and is still ongoing. And the board has decided most recently that the chief constable's period of leave should uh, be continued. But just to be clear, the previous chairman did make representations uh, to, the, to the view that um, the chief constable should be reinstated. Uh, what, what I can confirm is that I uh, understand that at certain points over the over recent uh, months, the chief constable, uh, sorry, the uh, chair of the authority, the former chair of the authority, uh, was of the view that reinstatement may be appropriate. Well, why did that not happen then? Is that a government decision? No, it, it, it is a decision for the board. Uh, from the point of view of government, I can certainly confirm that our interest has been in ensuring that proper uh, processes and procedures are followed uh, at all times, as you would expect. And we have certainly been, uh, we have certainly wanted to ensure that the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner would be involved and uh, would have a say uh, in terms of her view on uh, the return or otherwise of the Chief Constable. So if the, presumably then what you're saying is um, when the former chair made it clear that he wanted the chief constable reinstated, that the Scottish government's position was that that's a matter for the board and the Scottish government would have no view on the matter? Well, our, uh, the, the view from government, certainly the view from uh, the, the view that I uh, that I would take is that while it is a decision for the board, there is an interest on the part of the government in ensuring that due process um, has been followed at all times, and we would certainly seek assurances that due process was being followed. Due process had been followed, and the chair wanted the presumably by the time the chair said that he wanted the former chair said he wanted the chief constable reinstated, he was satisfied due process had been uh, complied with. So presumably, then, if he made that request, the response from government would be that's a matter for the board. 
or would the government express a view as to whether the Chief Constable should or should not be reinstated? Uh, it is not for the government to make a decision at this stage on whether or not the Chief Constable should or should not be reinstated. Discussions that will, will let me be clear that discussions that we have had with the police authority on these matters have focused on the need to ensure that due process is followed and that those with an interest, in particular the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner, um, are consulted. Can I just ask then finally to be absolutely clear, when Andrew Flanagan asked that the Chief Constable reinstated, was reinstated, that the Scottish Government's response was not to refuse to allow that to happen? Well, um, in the course of discussions about whether or not um, the Chief Constable reinstated, the government's concern and the, and the point that the government has emphasised is around the need for due process to be followed in that matter. That's not my question. My question is, you say that, confirm that Andrew Flanagan did request or did say that the Chief Constable should be reinstated a number of weeks ago. So why has he not been reinstated? Uh, well, at least in part... Uh, that uh, that is likely to be because of uh, because of the point that I've emphasised that the need for full process to be followed, the need for those with an interest and a locus in this issue to be uh, to be consulted and for proper consideration to be given to the issues. And my understanding is that 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 now having happened, um, with parties having been uh, consulted, um, the decision has been taken to continue the period of leave. So who's consulted? Well, in particular, my expectation is that given that the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner is the body with the possession of all of the facts, that she should be consulted uh, before decisions are made but on presumably return. Presumably, before, before Andrew Flanagan made this request, he must have been aware of the outcome of the investigations into the allegations against the Chief Constable. One presumes that the Chair didn't express the view the Chief Constable should be reinstated without him, first of all, being cleared by Park. So, given that that would be the situation, uh, unless you're telling me that was not the situation, uh, he's, he has expressed a view that the Chief Constable should be reinstated. So, was that discussed at an SPA board meeting? Uh, the SPA board has certainly given consideration to these issues, yes. Specifically, the chair's view that the chief constable should be reinstated, was that discussed at the board? Was um, that considered at the board? I'm sorry, I don't have details as to... I think these, these are issues that will have been discussed in part by the board meeting privately, and I was not a party to those discussions. Well, I know you're not party to it, but you know you get the agenda in advance. So in the agendas that you've seen in advance... Has, I, th I think you need to be a bit straighter with us here, Paul. Remember that you're effectively under oath. So I'll ask you again, has the SPA board dis discussed the view of the then chair that the chief constable should be reinstated? Yes or no? So I, I think the SPA board will have discussed that. I'm not sure it would be on a formal agenda, certainly not an agenda that I have seen on the basis that these would be matters that would be discussed privately. So but I'm certainly clear that um, the reason that the, the, the role for government here is around due process, and we have made clear our expectations that due process will be followed. Right, so you're telling me that the SPA board... Uh, has only, in, in discussing this item, which is of absolutely top importance to the whole police service in Scotland, where we have a, an individual, the Chief Constable, on 210 grand a year, presumably on full salary while he's on special leave, uh, that that was not done at a formal board meeting, that it's part of the kind of underhand activity we heard about earlier. Well, I think there is, provi there is provision for the board to meet in private, and my understanding is those decisions uh, were made privately. So there was a private board meeting that discussed whether, in the view of the chairman, if, if, if the chairman was right in wanting the chief constable reinstated. <coughs> so that was a private meeting. You obviously had advance notice that it was going to be discussed, even although the discussion was in private and you're not part of the discussion. So what was the outcome of the board meeting? We would not necessarily have notice of a private uh, board. Come on, Paul, we're talking about the chief executive. Are you telling me as the accountable officer, the SPA board meets in private to discuss the view of the then chairman that the chief constable should be reinstated 
and you as the accountable officer don't know the outcome of that meeting. I don't believe you. Well, I am confirming that um, that I have I am not cited on all of the private meetings of the Scottish Police Authority. Well, I have no. confirmed to the I've confirmed to you that uh, there have been discussions with the chair um, uh, about of the former chair rather about whether or not the uh, chief constable should return. And the, cons and, and, I, and the concern of government is that that is a decision that is taken properly and uh, with, with full regard to due process. Um, and uh, that has been the extent of um, our, our involvement. The extent of our involvement has been to require that, proce that due so, process so you, to be followed. You are saying, as the accountable officer, you were aware of a private meeting of the SPA board to discuss... A, the view of the former chairman that chief constable should be reinstated. You can't tell me when that meeting took place. You can't. You rightly tell me you weren't involved in those discussions, but you can't tell me the outcome of the meeting. Well, I, I, Surely the chair would have, at the very least, phoned you and said, "Look, we have had this discussion, and this is the view of the board." It's. it's, it's I mean, what you're saying is quite frankly not credible. Well, I. I I, I was not uh, called after meetings to be told about the outcome of, of, of this meeting. Of the meeting a number of weeks ago, and you don't know the outcome, and you're the accountable officer. Well, I'm the accountable officer for the justice portfolio. I'm not the accountable officer for the Scottish Police Authority, and so, the Scottish so Police Authority itself um, is responsible for ensuring that it complies <laughs> with its uh, with its obligations as the employer. So, don't be told the cabinet secretary that the chair wants to reinstate the chief constable. The SPA board has discussed it in private and nobody's told the Cabinet Secretary they're discussing it or what the outcome is. Is that what you're telling me? Well, I am saying that the SPA is, um, it, it is able to meet privately, but on an issue such as the reinstatement of the Chief Constable, I'm also absolutely clear that the role of government would be around ensuring that uh, all due process is followed. And I think if we look at the situation as at present, you can see that the, uh, that the Chief Constable remains on leave. Can I just clarify, uh, is, has there been any refusal by the Chief Constable to come back to work? Uh, not so far as I'm aware. OK. Um, could I ask two questions just arising from that, just so I'm clear? Um, I'm very clear you didn't receive a call from the SPA chair. Um, did anybody within the Justice Department receive a call with the outcome of that meeting? Not to the best of my knowledge. OK. So no call was received. They didn't tell you anything. They didn't, given the sensitivities, <laughs> report to anybody at all within the department. Um, as, to the best of my knowledge, there were no discussions with officials um, on, the, on, on the particular uh, matter to which you refer. OK, was the discussion with any ministers then? So as I say, there have been discussions with, uh, with, the, with the Cabinet Secretary about the issue of the return of the... Uh, of the Chief Constable and the emphasis that was given um, in those discussions um, w was around the need for proper process to be followed. Okay. Was, was, <laughs> was, was, was the outcome of those meetings then, or that final meeting, reported to the Cabinet Secretary? Um, my understanding is that now this is a matter that receives ongoing consideration. Sure, sure. And, and, but and, I'm asking... and that there is now. Um, uh, my expectation is that there is uh, full engagement with government to ensure that we are aware of okay. both when the consideration is being given, the uh, matters that are being considered, um, and the outcome of those uh, okay, discussions. So if I shorten that, you didn't receive the phone call, but the Cabinet Secretary did, the, as part of this ongoing engagement you talk about. Uh, there have been all those ongoing okay, discussions that, with the Cabinet that, Secretary. That's fine. Let, let, let me just, I'm slightly confused. Let me ask you about why did the Board meet to discuss this? What happened that they met to discuss this issue? I think the position that the board arrived at when agreeing to the special leave was that it was a matter that they would keep under regular review. Well, why so, at this point? So uh, they agreed to keep it under review every few weeks. It, um, genuinely, I'll bring in Alex Neal in a minute. The, the thing I can't get my head around is actually, why would you have this discussion unless something triggered it? unless they had been briefed or advised in some way that the likely outcome of the investigation was to be was was to actually find that there was no case to answer 
if that was the case, I could have understood why the board had met to discuss this and why there was such an emphasis placed by the chair on reinstatement of the chief constable, because that isn't part of a regular review. They've heard something, which is why they've adopted that approach and reached a conclusion. And, you know, I don't know if you want to comment on that before I bring Mr Neil well, back Well, my in. comment is that this is a matter that the SPA agreed they would keep under regular review. So they were, uh, so they were having these ongoing uh, deliberations about the did, issue. Did, it, did at any point, did they decide that they wanted to reinstate, you know, the chief constable um, until that last meeting? Uh, well, as we've as as has been discussed already, I've acknowledged that at points the view of the former chair was that um, the circumstances it was that it may be justifiable to reinstate the chief constable, or for or for rather for his period of leave to be to be brought to an end. Alex, can, can I just say you say that the the only reason why the Scottish government would be concerned if was would be if the due process had not been completed, correct? Yes. So. Had due process been completed, has there any part of the process outstanding that has given you cause for concern that you don't believe due process has been followed? My understanding is that at certain points, including when um, when the chair, the former chair, had expressed the view that it may be appropriate for the chief constable to return, um, at that point there had not been um, proper or full consultation with the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner, hence um, the uh, wish on the part of the government for that to take place. And wh when was this? Was this in November? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, th I think it would have been November. I can furnish the so, committee with more information so on precise dates. I don't have them so in front of me. So we're now on the 21st of December. You have a chief constable who's on special leave, whichever that means, uh, whose reputation has been tarnished uh, because of events, rightly or wrongly. I don't know the outcome of the investigations, obviously. Uh, surely it's a matter of natural justice to him that these matters be cleared up as soon as possible. So you saying it's still not clear or you still haven't had the discussions with the chair of PAC to see if the due process has been followed? Well, I agree it's important that the that a proper investigation it take, is taken forward as speedily as possible. Um, and my understanding is that that, has not yet, that that investigation has not yet been concluded. So why did the, the, the chair recommend reinstatement then? Former chair. Well, the circumstances of the chief constable being on leave. What, what I understand from the SPA is that the chief constable was on leave uh, partly to uh, enable him to prepare his full case and to engage with the police investigations and review commissioner. I find a lot of this, quite frankly, not credible. I think we need to call our next meeting. I think the chief constable Andrew Flanagan. Uh, as well as the, probably the new chair convener. And the committee will consider that in private session. Can I invite Liam Ewing? Liam who? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That is an old friend, Liam Kerr. Indeed. <laughs> and go. I'm not an old friend, Jackie. You're a new friend. Sorry. Um, so, uh, <coughs> a couple of questions up front just about the Scottish Public Finance Manual. There is a section in there relating to settlement agreements. Uh, and a couple of terms I'm just seeking clarity on. First of all, on voluntary res resignation, which caught my eye because as opposed to an involuntary resignation, which I would have thought would be more like a dismissal. But there's a quote where it says, where a proposal has been made by a relevant body to offer a financial consideration to secure the voluntary resignation. Now that sounds like an offer that one can't refuse. Uh, can you explain what securing a voluntary resignation is? Well, I think we've provided to the clerk a, a definition of the various terms that are set out in the Scottish Public Finance Manual um, and acknowledge that there are quite a lot of different terms and we, so we do need to proceed with, with, with caution in relation to them. Um, certainly my understanding of the, uh, man, of, of the provisions of the manual is that um, voluntary uh, resignation is uh, an overarching term um, and that we that it is then possible to have specific um, schemes around uh, voluntary exit 
either voluntary release or voluntary early retirement um, approved by a particular body. And then on a case-by-case -case basis, it is possible to have um, unique schemes or indeed settlement agreements. Um, if, there are, if there's remaining doubt about terminology and about definitions, then I agree it's very important that that is, uh, that that is clarified and is something which I, I suggest we should do in writing. I, I think that is important, and uh, we'll come back to the early retirement in just a second, if I may. Uh, because, if I may suggest, we shouldn't have to proceed with caution in relation to terms. We, we should be absolutely clear what terms mean. And I, I just want to press you on something else which caught my mind, because a distinction is made between uh, severance agreements and a <coughs> settlement agreement. Uh, and a severance agreement somewhere, I forget exactly where, is defined as a subset of a settlement agreement. Can you just explain the difference to me? Because I'm not familiar with the difference between a severance agreement and a settlement agreement. It's quite the way you uh, put it, if I may say. Um, severance arrangements are the overarching uh, term that uh, that captures a number of different arrangements as set out in the Scottish Public Finance Manual, and settlement agreements are a subset of them. So a settlement agreement is the uh, document that is used in cases where there has been um, some breakdown in the relationship between the employee and the employer, and the report that has been submitted to the Parliament that the committee is considering today focuses on um, cases where settlement agreements have been put in place. Um, the Scottish Public Finance Manual makes it clear that where there is a settlement agreement, then it is important that there is prior consultation uh, with, with, with government. But there are um, other situations of severance or um, departure that are uh, not caught within that term settlement agreements. And as I say, they may be covered instead by a severance scheme. I was with you until that last phrase, Paul. Sorry. Um, covered by a severance scheme? Yes, e exactly. So it is possible. I'll try and get the, um, the right part of the, uh, the, the guidance. Th there are a number of references in the section of the Scottish Public Finance Manual that talk about um, existing or new schemes. Mm. These are schemes to enable the early departure of employees in an organisation. Which and the be scheme, captured. Well, the scheme requires approval of government if a public body is going to set up a scheme. What we have in the case of the Scottish Police Authority is an agreed scheme that has existed for a number of years, but that is reviewed and approved by, by ministers. So the committee will appreciate that given the significant change involved in police reform with a number of organisations merging into one, it has been necessary and appropriate to have in place a scheme. The scheme is approved mm -hmm. and it is then for the public body to make individual decisions once the scheme is in place. Those are not settlement agreements. I understand. Let's look then at uh, the, the scheme. Uh, you've obviously heard some events from earlier this morning that we've looked at. Um, paragraph one of uh, the Annex A that we have, which is the annual report on the use of settlement agreements, the Scottish Public Finance Manual states that in considering terms of settlement agreements, severance, early retirement or redundancy packages, public bodies should ensure issues of regularity, propriety and value for money are fully taken into account. Given what you've heard this morning, how obligatory is what I've just read out in your paragraph one. Well, I, I don't think I can add to the paragraph, really. It's, it's, it's important that public bodies are taking these matters uh, into account. It doesn't appear that that's what's happened this morning, though, from what we looked at. It, it doesn't appear, that, or there seems to have been a breakdown between what's stated about the SPFM and what's actually happened in practice. Do you accept that? Well... My understanding is that the SPA's view, certainly the view that has been expressed to me by the SPA, is that um, in the circumstances of uh, Mr Foley's departure, they consider that the options which they exercised did meet the tests. And, and, uh, and that's the board of the public body in question. Whichever that may be, it is for the board. And so the board is accountable if it has failed to do 
what's required by the Scottish Public Finance Manual? Ordinarily, it will be for the accountable officer to um, ensure that those requirements are met. But where the matters relate to the accountable officer, him or herself, mm -hmm. then the board needs to consider those issues. Thank you. Uh, do you have a view? So it's just moving on from that specifically, but uh, let's say we've got a severance package, which you would say would be embodied under a settlement agreement, presumably. Once individuals have left an organisation, how can they be held to account by this committee and by the public if they have gone away with a package under a settlement agreement? Um, so I'm not sure whether it's helpful to make the distinction again to emphasise that there was no settlement agreement in the case that the, that the committee that. has considered this morning. Mm -hmm. um, I, my assumption is that this committee could invite um, an individual who's received an agreement to come and give evidence, even though they are no longer um, employed by the particular public body. Well, of course, the committee could invite them to give evidence, but how is that individual, if the committee, if anyone else finds that there has been mismanagement, uh, impropriety, whatever it might be, how is that individual held to account and how is the public recompensed if there has been a settlement agreement? Well, I think there, um, clearly, if, if it was concluded that the settlement agreement had been issued uh, and there had been a clear failure then uh, to, to meet some of the required tests and standards, then I would absolutely want consideration to be given as to whether there was any possibility of recovery. I think a lot of these things will depend, though, on the individual contractual arrangements that are in place um, and the specifics of the contract between the employee and the employer. So I'm sorry, I don't have a, I certainly don't have a complete answer to, to that, uh, given the need to look at what the contract would, would, would actually say in the specific cases. Uh, are you aware of any cases where, let, let's take an individual, uh, they have perhaps underperformed, uh, perhaps there's a Section 22 report that's been presented to this committee, perhaps they've left an organisation maybe under a settlement agreement, perhaps not. Uh, are you aware of any cases where an individual such as that might have been re-employed in the public sector? We have a rule in place in the Scottish Government which has operated from uh, 2015 and it's a five-year no-return policy. Um, therefore, if an individual receives a payment, uh, whether under a settlement agreement or not, then they may not be re-employed um, in the Scottish Government or by any of our associated agencies or bodies for that five-year period. And just to be clear, the associated bodies that are, include all of those that were listed in your letter at the appendix, is that? All of those bodies, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I just pursue that for one minute? None of them are brought back as consultants? Uh, that would certainly be one of the circumstances. That would be one of the circumstances that I think would, would breach that five-year no-return rule. Oh, that's interesting because I understand that some have indeed been brought back as consultants. Well, that's certainly something that I'd be happy to uh, look into. Excellent. Um, could I just continue the line of discussion and, and let me just be, be very open here. You, you heard the evidence we took um, from the Auditor General on the 1617 annual report um, into the Scottish Police Authority. And you heard as well the evidence we, we received about um, very poor financial judgment, very poor accountability and governance arrangements, which frankly I think the committee found to be quite shocking. Um, I wonder whether I could explore with you both the package arrived at for the accountable officer, in this case the chief exec, former chief executive John Foley, and also some of the decisions that were made by him in his capacity as accountable officer. And, and just to be clear about terminology, um, by the Scottish Government's own definition, a severance package includes early retirement and redundancy payments, both of which seem to have come into play in, in Mr Foley's package. Um, we heard that payment might not have been completely made at this point. Um, can I ask whether there is the opportunity 
to pause that payment and whether you would go away and investigate that as to whether that would be allowed under whatever contractual agreements you've come to with Mr Foley. So my starting point would be to emphasise that there is not a contract between uh, Mr Foley and the Scottish Government in this issue. My understanding, uh, in fact, my clear understanding is that the contractual arrangement is between the Scottish Police Authority as his employer uh, and him, and that um, a contract was entered into um, for his release in August. I am not, uh, I, I don't have all the information as to when exactly payments have been made and when other payment, whether payments may yet be made. Um, in light of the committee's deliberations today, I can certainly um, ask the police authority to um, confirm whether or not payments are outstanding and if so, whether, uh, whether they uh, could be paused. That would be enormously helpful. And I, whilst I recognise the contract may not be with the Scottish Government, you are the sponsoring department and therefore have some responsibility, in my view, in ensuring that, that these things happen. Um, can I ask, because we, again, were interested in pursuing who knew what and when they knew it and you know people's involvement in all of this, um, we understood that the decision was taken by the board about Mr Foley's package by email and that at some point... Um, between the 7th of June, when the options were considered, um, and indeed most recently, that the Scottish Government were most certainly advised. And I think um, emails were exchanged with senior civil servants. Could you tell us who those civil servants were, um, and indeed whether it was brought to your attention that these discussions were ongoing? So my a starting point in this would be to emphasise that at no point was the Scottish Government... Um, consulted or at no point was the approval of the Scottish <coughs> Government sought on the uh, payment that was offered. Now, I would also wish to emphasise that at no point was the Scottish Government's approval required, given that there was an existing scheme in place. That's not to say that there are not issues thrown up by this case which require to be looked at very carefully with a view to looking at whether changes might be needed in future. But at no point was the Scottish Government's uh, specific approval sought. There were, uh, as you would expect, there are a number of um, engagements that take place between officials um, in the Justice uh, and Safer Communities Directorates and the Scottish Police Authority about a range of ongoing issues. And I am aware that some conversations took place over the summer um, about the proposed arrangements for Mr Foley's departure. Uh, as I said at the outset, I can see that there is a, an interest in the precise chronology of those, and I can seek to provide the committee with further information uh, about exactly uh, what, co what communication took place, uh, by whom and when. What I can say is that I wrote more formally to the chair of the Scottish Police Authority about this payment um, in November, um, when I was aware of the uh, of the concerns that uh, that existed, both on the part of uh, colleagues in my team uh, and also on the part of Audit Scotland, um, and uh, again I can furnish the committee with that correspondence. I think that would be very helpful. I would be keen to capture um, not just the email exchanges, but any verbal exchanges that would have been noted of a matter of this importance. It is customary for civil servants to note these type of conversations. So we would be interested in seeing that as well. Um, I, I'm very clear that, that whilst you, your approval wasn't sought and the government's approval wasn't sought, you knew about the ongoing discussions, <laughs> you knew about the options, and you would have, in the course of those conversations, given guidance as to what the Scottish Government's view would be. Is that a fair summary of what you've said? It is fair, and I would go on to add that, the cons that, that I expressed uh, reservations or indeed concerns about the issues around payment in lieu of notice that the committee has considered today. And I think that's very helpful to, to have on the record. Um, turning to your... your it's severance policy and, and uh, um, interpreting that. Um, it's very clear that notification needs to be given to the sponsoring department in the Scottish Government, um, and that seems to have happened. Um, but indeed, where issues are sensitive, they are escalated to ministerial level. Um, and therefore, I'm curious to know, um, given how active the Cabinet Secretary was on the previous issue explored to you with Alex Neil, whether the Cabinet Secretary knew about the ongoing discussions that were going on. 
well, can I be clear in terms of the severance uh, policy set out in the Public Finance Manual that the need to consult with ministers um, applies in the case of those individual arrangements where there's a settlement ag arrangement. Um, it does not apply specifically in cases where um, exit is agreed as part of a scheme that has already been approved that will have been subject to ministerial approval. Um, however, I absolutely recognise the, um, the high profile nature of this particular exit under the um, approved scheme. And uh, as I say, although we did not have an opportunity to, um, to, although we did not need to and did not have an opportunity to approve it, um, on being made aware of it, uh, we would have briefed the uh, Cabinet Secretary on, its, on, on what was proposed. Okay, so the Cabinet Secretary knew that. That's helpful again to have on the record. Um, I'm conscious of time, so let me ask you two very quick points, and I'll wrap it into one. Um, you are responsible for conducting the annual review of Andrew Flanagan, are you not? Well, yes, and he I, I, in turn, I and he in turn is responsible for conducting the annual performance review of John Foley. That's correct. Was there anything in your discussions with him as part of his annual performance review that highlighted the serious concerns we're now considering? How how did you rate their performance? Well, some of the issues, in fact, I think all of the issues that the committee is considering today have arisen in the context of the. Uh, audit that has been done in recent months by Audit Scotland. Um, I have, over the period of the chair's um, appointment, been in uh, regular engagement with him, and indeed there are formal performance appraisals conducted. Now, um, those are obviously uh, discussions between two individuals, and I don't think the committee would expect me to um, go into all of the details of those. I've clearly been in front of the committee before uh, where uh, other issues have been um, raised around uh, governance in uh, the Scottish Police Authority, and I can confirm that they absolutely have been discussed uh, between uh, myself and the chair. Well, it can only appear to me that he wasn't really listening when you were um, making some of the comments to him. I don't know if other members would like to come in at this juncture. Liam Kerr. Just very briefly, if I may, <clears throat> you talk about the contract that was entered into for the release, I think you said, of uh, Mr Foley. Uh, at least in the early stages, that was styled as a redundancy. If there is a redundancy, there is a dismissal. If there is a dismissal, it is capable of being an unfair dismissal, and therefore there's a risk... Uh, and there is a risk of some kickback uh, absent a settlement agreement. Uh, in such circumstances, I, I would struggle to recall an employer <clears throat> who wouldn't have at least considered a settlement agreement. So who took the decision not to use a settlement agreement and why? So there were, uh, again, I can confirm this as part of providing a detailed timeline to the committee. Uh, my understanding is there were some informal discussions uh, with government about whether or not a settlement agreement would be something that we would be likely to support, because you'll be aware that individual settlement agreements must come to ministers um, for, for comment. Um, and uh, you say d individual discussions with government ministers, I think. No, that would be... No, the discussions would have taken place um, with officials um, in the teams for which I have responsibility as part of their ongoing uh, regular engagement with the Scottish Police Authority. Uh, but I, uh, I, am, I am aware of the fact that discussions took place about whether or not a settlement agreement would be uh, something that, we, that, that the government would support, and we were, uh, we were not... Uh, inclined to uh, support a settlement agreement. Are you able to tell me why? Well, we are, I am absolutely mindful of concerns that have been raised by uh, this committee and by the need to ensure uh, proper uh, and effective use of public money in all cases. Um, so I will always be uh, looking very carefully at any proposal to uh, pay money that is in uh, that perhaps goes beyond what is uh, contract what, what an individual is contractually entitled to receive. Uh, Forgive me, because the, the, the settlement agreement simply embodies the deal that's made, and the, the deal that was struck is the payment in lieu of notice, of course, which would be a contractual payment, but then there's this early retirement payment, uh, at least some element of which, and we'll find out next year, 
uh, will be non-contractual. It'll be some kind of ex gratia, uh, one would have thought. Uh, I, I just don't understand why you wouldn't put the settlement agreement in place to protect the employer going forward. Well, certainly, um, my understanding of this is that there is that the payments that are being made are consistent with the requirements of the agreed severance scheme um, that is in that is in place. So there are a number of individuals who uh, depart from SPA from Police Scotland, um, and they do so on a consistent basis. That is on the basis of the approved severance scheme without any settlement agreement. Um, so I certainly, having considered this earlier, uh, couldn't see why there would be a need for a specific settlement agreement in this case, and that rather the scheme itself, already approved, was the scheme that should operate. Okay. I've had no indication from other members of questions. Oh, Mr Coffey. 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 Thanks very much. I wonder if I could just uh, ask some questions relating to the paper that we've got in front of us today, and maybe also get a, a chance to bring Mr Gray into the discussion, who's been sitting <coughs> very patiently and hasn't been able to contribute. Just to ask firstly, Paul, wh wh what's the Scottish Government's actual role in the whole management and monitoring of all these various arrangements? What's our specific role? Well, the role includes uh, consultation on any proposed settlement agreement, um, and then, uh, importantly, involves reporting, reporting to this Parliament, and that is so. That's a that's a fundamental aspect of the government role that we that we uh, both are consulted on any proposed agreements, and we uh, we will consider a range of issues as part of that consultation, such as whether or not there should be a confidentiality clause, such as whether uh, we think value for money would be achieved in the settlement agreement, um, and then we will report to Parliament. Uh, there is also a responsibility for ministers in relation to the overall policy framework in relation to severance and settlement agreements. And as the committee is aware, a consultation uh, took place earlier in the year on those issues. And the, the kind of breadth of these kind of arrangements throughout the public sector and elsewhere, actually, how long have these kinds of arrangements been in place? And has there anything particularly has, has changed about these kinds of arrangements in the last, or even in this session of this parliament that you, you, you're familiar with? I'll hand over to Paul. <clears throat> it, it used to be the case that um, confidentiality clauses were so arranged that it was not even possible to disclose the fact that a settlement agreement had been entered into. So, in other words, you would neither confirm nor deny that, uh, that such an agreement had been entered into. Uh, predecessor to this committee. Uh, made very strong representations that they thought that was inappropriate in terms of use of public funds. Um, we agreed and we removed that particular form of settlement agreement from the options that were available. Um, uh, I know that members have expressed perhaps differing views on the matter, um, uh, but um, it was the case that in the NHS uh, when I came into this role, um, of 148 uh, settlement agreements, 147 had included confidentiality clauses. There was concern both through this committee and in Parliament and in um, public discourse that somehow these confidentiality uh, agreements were either uh, inhibiting people uh, who may have concerns from raising them, and as Paul Johnson has said, no confidentiality agreement <coughs> or clause can stop someone making a public interest disclosure. Um, however, uh, Mr Neil, as then Cabinet Secretary for, for Health, concluded that and, uh, the, the best approach was to remove the pre presumption in favour. So all health service settlement agreements draft up to that point included a confidentiality clause. It was there automatically. We removed the automatic inclusion. There's a draft clause is available if it is required. Similarly, a draft derogatory statements clause is available if required. But these are matters for negotiation. They are not automatically included. So there have been some changes as a result of um, the interventions of the parliament and also um, views of ministers. So the, the direction of change has been towards more openness, accountability, scrutiny and so on and so forth, would you say? Well, that's that the intention, certainly. I mean, I, I'd I, as I know colleagues do, firmly subscribe to the view 
that the expenditure of public funds must be transparent. And just last point is that there are some tables at the, in the report there that show some figures across various sectors, and the NHS is in there as well, Paul. Is there anything of particularly standout nature in here, unusually high, low, breaking trends, for example? Because it's hard for us as an audit committee to see if there's anything significant about this. Or is this part and parcel of what happens within a service the size of the NHS? So, so, so in a in a service uh, the size of the National Health Service, employing over one hundred and fifty thousand staff, I think to have thirty six settlement agreements in a year would uh, not be regarded as a disproportionate use of that approach. Um, most of these, many of these, relate to relatively junior members of staff, and I think the points that are made, and, and uh, the, the, the committee has the report, so I won't read them out. But the points that are made in paragraphs five. Uh, through to eight are important in, uh, de in, in defining the areas in which a settlement agreement might be used. Quite often it's used because the costs of pursuing other approaches would be higher. So in fact, it reduce, reduces the cost to the public purse. That would be the normal uh, basis on value for money terms where you would, would, where you would take this approach. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Okay. Could I thank both the witnesses for coming along um, this morning, both Mr Johnson and Mr Gray, for your evidence. And I'll now move the committee into private session.